Thank you, Cody. I, I like Cody. You know, he says nice things about me. I keep coming back, and the pay is good, too. Uh, I mean that seriously, that the kind of people that we have at Dome who care about this institution, and he simply symbolizes all the rest of them, many of whom are in this room, that makes a difference. I've been to a number of institutions and served there, and I, I like them a lot. I cared about them. And the best ones always had people like Cody, who would part of the institution fabric. We are fortunate. I think the committee did a great job. I think we have a very balanced group. It's good to see different sports represented, and it's good to see gender represented. We know that they are great athletes because they've got the credentials to prove it, and you've read some of those. But those are only on the surface of what they really accomplished. You would have had to have, be there to watch them or follow Ms. Hamilton around, I guess, on the course. But to see then the, the poise and the confidence and the ability to perform under pressure that those of us that we knew could do. We're sorry that two of those people are gone, but this is a good way to remember them, and to remember them for a long and forever time. Sport. Sport is a human endeavor. Sport is a product, of course, of plethora, that's for Cody, of human activities. If you don't know the joke is that sometime during every football game, the, the flags will go up from many different officials at the same time, to which the announcer, Cody, refers to a plethora of flags on the field. Sport is an existential expression, and it is production of existential moments. Now, if you don't know anything about existentialism, you'd have to be conscious of the fact that after World War II, there was a kind of small group of philosophers and writers who sprung up in Europe, particularly in France, Camus, Chartres, others, and they were much shaken by World War II. Not only France had been occupied, but if you looked around Europe, there were signs and tremors of what this war had caused. And if you look in the Pacific and the East, similarly, this was catastrophic for the world. And you, be they, you begin to ask questions. Why? What, what has happened here? Where are the values that would, in fact, create such Holocausts. And then as they thought about that, they reached two conclusions. The first conclusion was that humans create values, not the gods, not Mother Nature, but humans create values. And the second unto it was that in your humanness, is then the meaning of your life. And so it is not the product, but it is a process. Sport, in the context of existential, is about playing it. In other words, the real intensity and joy of sport is actually playing it. And in that sense, you began at the beginning, learning, as children oftentimes, how one competes, how one learns a game 
or that game, any game, learning and beginning to enjoy, not that, but this. Not over here, but over there. In that sense, you move then to practice. Here we are now, trying to get those bodies and that mind and that spirit all on the same page at the same time. And as we grow in the sport, we begin to see it come together. That it's not thinking every time we do something, but we are just doing it. We are in, therefore, beginning the existential state that life is. We do it. And finally then, you come to the point of winning and losing. You test yourself. You put yourself on the field, in the course, in the test of can you play this sport. Existential moments happen for every athlete sometimes when it all suddenly comes together. It could be just in that kind of moment when you least expect it, but suddenly you don't care. The crowd is not there as far as you're concerned. I have seen golfers do this. It's incredible. Of course, Nobody can say anything during the golf, but <laughs> tennis is even worse. Shh. But the fact is, on the basketball court, in the big arena, they hear nothing. They are in the moment. They are in the act of doing, in producing sport. And that is what, therefore, begins to show to the audience, and we begin to get then a symbiotic relationship between those of us who are sitting and those of us who are playing. When you get to a great athlete, they have many moments like this. And that's how we begin to realize that they are somehow different from the rest of us. They can also create the moment. And we know terrible and long numbers of examples, but I think one of the most recent is Tom Brady. He's 40 years old, and he embraces it, and he makes it happen creatively because he's in the moment. He can do this. And he doesn't. I'll never done. But he can. And he will. And he will try. These athletes fit that profile. They were better than the rest of us. They were better than the rest of most of their competitors against them. They made a statement an existential statement of playing the game at such a high level that others could not be with them, could not stay the course. That's why we honor them today. If I get my papers straight now, we'll finish this thing. When this happens, you know, one of the most common things in basketball now, I, I, I'm a basketball nut, but is the dunk. And I grew up in a time in when, A, the coaches wouldn't let you if you could, and most of us couldn't, so it didn't really matter. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, even with all the dunks that happen, at critical times, a dunk can create that relationship between the crowd and the play. 
I saw it happen the other day when Nebraska was playing Butler. Nebraska wasn't doing much. Roby dunks the ball. Suddenly, 16,000 people were on their feet shouting about Nebraska, and from then on, Nebraska played better. A symbiotic moment of an existential moment caused by a player who decided to take the game into his hands. Well, the body of work here is clear. One last thing. There's a lot of comparisons. I've been reading your book recently, just finished it, sent it down to my son. It's a book about uh, Bob Cousy and his, his impact on NBA basketball and his re strange relationship with Bill Russell. And so it's Cousy and Russell. In that book, Cousy is interviewed time and time again, about 60 times, by the author, reminiscing about his whole career. But Bob Cousy was the original point guard, the one who made the statement of how you play the game. And with all the tricks behind the back, around the shoulders, all the dribbles that he could do, and virtually all of us tried in high school to imitate and could not do. But in that, they asked him, well, how would you do? He's 93 years old or something like that. How would you do against those guys there that you're watching on the television? And, you know, Curry and LeBron and you know, the sort. Oh, he said, we'd probably take two out of ten, maybe. But everybody knew Coos never bragged. So he thought probably a few more, but he wouldn't say it. Great athletes are forever. It doesn't matter if Mr. Juarez was back in the 40s. It doesn't matter that some of you were up in the 90s. And in this Hall of Fame, we are stating that we recognize greatness forever and forever a tiger. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Pam Rainforth Van Heufel, a 1992 Doan grad. Pam comes from a great Doan family. Wood River, Nebraska, do I have that right? I remember that. As her sister Mary and her brother Chris also graduated from Doan. Pam will share a few thoughts about one of her Doan classmates and friends, Anne Marie Hamilton. Pam, come forward. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, when I was asked to introduce Anne Marie, uh, I blindly accepted, you know, what, what wouldn't I do for Anne Marie? Um, then reality kicked in. Uh, we haven't seen, outside of seven years ago, which I had forgotten about, um, seen or directly talked to each other for over a decade, maybe two. Sure, we've liked and commented on each other's uh, Facebook posts. But what could I possibly say to accurately portray what makes Anne Marie special, outstanding, and deserving of the Hall of Fame? Fortunately, Annie did all the hard work, as you can see in the program, um, with all of her accomplishments at Doan and Golf. But what can I say beyond that? Well, I still not, I'm still not sure, but here goes. Uh, 31 years ago, I came to Doan to help my older sister move home for the summer. Uh, this was Mary. Um, through the course of the first evening, I met Eric Hamilton, a.k.a. Ernie. And we laughed and had fun the way only Doan College students could back in the day. 
before we went, or before we all went our separate ways, Ernie said to me, you have to room with my sister. And so I thought, yeah, okay, all right. Well, a few weeks later, I get a call from this girl from Craig, Colorado, and she says her older brother told us that the two of us were just gonna be perfect roommates. Now, I don't know about perfect, because I'm sure I was a lot to take in at the time, um, but what great friends we became. She was funny, sarcastic, even devious at times, and to me, she seemed fearless. I would have followed her anywhere, and in fact, I think I did, <laughs> along with a lot of other five six. <laughs> she was a leader among her friends in college, loyal, caring, and selfless, all characteristics, it seems, she held on to throughout her life. She was a teacher. Sure, she studied education here and fine-tuned her already innate ability to connect with the younger generation. But she was a teacher by nature and still is in her everyday life. In catching up a bit on the phone, um, she let me know that she had spent many of her years teaching and coaching golf. I was really happy to hear that after the not-so-stellar experience she had attempting to teach me how to play. <laughs> you could say I was maybe her first student, but definitely her worst student. <laughs> and if I remember correctly, my one and only lesson ended in throwing the club, throwing the ball, and shouting some pretty long strings of profanity. <laughs> so I'm glad you recovered from that and went on to do what you're truly meant to do, Annie, and that's teach. Throughout the last several years, she's continued to be a caring and selfless leader after moving back to her hometown. Reviving the Booster Club at her alma mater in Colorado and connecting local businesses with the school by inviting them in to teach students about their businesses and opportunities in their hometown. She continues to be passionate about teaching kids and presenting them with opportunities. She is undoubtedly passionate about one kid in particular, and that's her son. Her devotion to him is reminiscent of her parents' devotion to her. Family has always meant the world to Anne Marie, and she continues to set an example of love and loyalty for the next generation, whether it be her golf students, her son, or anyone having the privilege of spending time with her. So to get on with things, I'll end by saying what an honor it is to be able to introduce you all to my first roommate, my partner in crime, and my dear old friend, Anne Marie Hamilton. Sometimes it's hard to be spoken about because usually it's me doing the accolades to someone else. So thank you very much, Pam. Um, when I got the official letter from Cody, I uh, stood a little taller and I've had this permagrin on my face ever since and it's, it's not going away. And when I got here today and connected with some old friends I hadn't seen in seven years again, it's, uh, I've laughed, my cheeks are hurting, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm very honored to be here tonight with an amazing class, April, Frank, Brad, and Terry. I am sorry I did not to get the opportunity to meet Frank or Terry. Their bios are incredible, but it's an honor that your fam their families are here tonight. I did get to meet a couple of them, and it's a privilege to be here with that. I do wish that, um, I, I stood at the Hall of Fame and was looking at pictures today and it, I was mesmerized by the, the talent and the history up there. And uh, it was a bit overwhelming that I actually get to join that. I wish Gene Chupan was here, he was my coach. 
to share this with me because if it wasn't for him and my folks, I wouldn't be here for that. Gene was someone you loved. He loved his keno, his golf, and he loved us girls, um, and he put up with us girls. And Gene didn't miss much when he was around, but he is surely missed today. I do, however, get the opportunity to thank my mom and dad who are here tonight. My mom used to pile my brother and I into a suburban with other kids. She'd drive us all over the state of Colorado. And she'd sit there while we played six or seven hours, never complain, drive us home. And she was in the, always in the background, but she always did stuff for us. And I don't think she knows how special that is. And so thank you, Mom. Um, when I started high school, I was going to play volleyball. And then I uh, thought uh, there was no way in hell I was going to wear those underwear-looking <laughs> shorts. I was not happening, no way. So I said, I'm, I'll go golf, you know? So um, my dad at the time, he said uh, he would beg me to practice. I'd be like, no, 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 I'm good. And he said one day, he said, I will pay you to practice. Pay me. I'm like, I can't waste my time on the driving range, Dad. I've got things to do. But I was kind of wondering if maybe that opportunity still was out there. <laughs> Shakes his head. He said, that ship sailed, girl. <laughs> but he did give me the opportunity to come to college and pay for it. And I do help him on the driving range when he decides to listen to me. Um, and that time with you is very valuable, and I, I thank you, Dad. Um, when I came to Doan, I was intrigued by not just the academic side, but the athletic side of it. You had professors who made sure you succeeded and got a degree. And the coaches that strived to push you for greatness. Um, and I sat back and I was watching all of these friends of mine and players go to practice and games. And I thought, I'm missing out. Pam and I would run and I'm like, oh, I can't do this anymore. We'd get lost on Thunder Road. And uh, so I thought, well, I'm gonna, I asked if I could play golf. Well, back in the olden days, they didn't have a girls team. But the boys, they let me play. And I played with them a while, and we had a good time. And Gene approached me, and he said, hey, if you get a couple girls together, we can have a women's team. Oh, my gosh. I grabbed him, and I said, are you kidding me? I get to play the ladies' tees? And he's like, and I, that's all I needed to hear. And I went out and I found four girls. And I, I don't know if they were at the time so afraid of me that they were like, yeah, we'll play with you. So, but they did, and I, they opened up a door for me to continue in golf where I get to work with my son, my dad, and my man, Craig. So it's, it's been great that when I did get these girls to join that ride with me, um, typically, you have five people on your team. We only had four. Um, so every score counted. We couldn't drop a score, so you had to show up. And we went down to the district tournament, and our four of us showed up. And we got in the van with our big old trophy, and we, we lit that van up like only girls can do. <laughs> and Gene at that time, I mean, he girled it up with us. <laughs> and we, we started heading back to school and he passes that creed exit just flying. And we're like, hey, coach, where are we going? He said, if you thought I was taking you back without a celebration, you are wrong. So we uh, go up to Lincoln, we have this prime rib champagne. The waiter was getting into it with us, had a great time. And to this day, I love prime rib. I love champagne, and I think that that meal, every time I sit to it, is like a championship meal. So it's a great honor to know that the women's golf team is still in existence today. Um, I wish Coach Foster and your girls team the best of luck and in future endeavors. And if you do want me to go to Hawaii, I am there. <laughs> Uh, Cody is going to pay for that, right? Sure. <laughs> when I think back to my days at Doan, I smile, I laugh, my cheeks hurt. It was a good education, the best of times, amazing sports, 
and lifelong friends. And as I look out here and I see those friends of mine that I don't see for maybe 20 years, 7 years, 30 years, they're all here. You can pick up the phone, call them, and it's like we never missed a beat. And I love you for being here. Thank you. Don't, sorry, one more thing. <laughs> Don't has a very special and unique place in my heart. And sometimes when I do or say something that's kind of out of the blue and I get a funny look, I just look at him back and I say, it's a Don thing. <laughs> so thank you very much. Ray Krogan came to Don from Arnold, Nebraska. He graduated from Don in 1972 and was a basketball teammate of Terry Egger. Ray has supported Doan in many ways over the years and continues to be a great friend and supporter of our athletic department, especially our men's basketball program, where Ray supports the Terry Egger Scholarship. The original plan was for Ray to speak about Terry and present the plaque. Things change, floods happen, and Ray is unable to be here tonight. So we'll shift gears and remember Terry in a very positive light from my point of view and from those of his fraternity at Doan. Before Coach Erickson passed away in 2009, I asked him about what Doan basketball players he would recommend for our Athletic Hall of Fame. Those of you who remember Coach Erickson, there was no gray area, very little gray area. It was either black or white. Terry was on the top of his list. No hesitation. Coach recruited Terry to Doan, and later it was my pleasure to be involved in Chad's recruitment to Doan. Coach and I were invited into the Egger home, and we signed Chad to be on the Doan men's basketball team. Things had come full circle. There are other examples of this type of situation, maybe at other schools, but maybe not very often, and that's what makes Doan so special. Sarah Erickson really wanted to be here tonight but she's under the weather. When she called to tell me that she could not attend, she told me that she had a picture of Coach Erickson with Terry and that she wanted the Egger family to have it. Now I know you can't see this very well from afar and I'm gonna give it to Peg in just a few moments, but this is a classic picture. That's from Sarah. When they heard about tonight's program, members of Sigma Phi Theta approached me about their presentation of Terry's induction into our Athletic Hall of Fame. Trey Perry, a senior from McCool Junction, will now come forward. Thank you. Um, as Cody said, my name is Trey Perry. I'm uh, the current president of Sigma Phi Theta. Um, unfortunately, myself and the rest of the current uh, active members in the fraternity um, were not able to meet Terry, um, which is a shame because from what I've heard, he was um, an outstanding man uh, during his time at Doan and afterwards. Um, fortunately, we have an alumni, uh, his name's Mike Nichols, who went to school here um, with Terry um, when he was here. Um, and immediately when Mike uh, heard of Terry's induction into the Hall of Fame, he contacted us um, and told us about the induction um, and kind of gave us a background of Terry and what he had done at Doan um, and asked if maybe we would be able to present on his behalf because Mike wouldn't be able to make it tonight. Um, of course, we agreed right away because uh, he did so much for Doan and once a Siggy, always a Siggy. Um, so uh, we asked Mike to write a little excerpt um, uh, for us to read here since he couldn't make it. So here it is. Anyone who lived in southeast Nebraska in the late 60s knew of Terry's, Terry Eggers' athletic talents. Terry was a talented athlete at Tiny Sprague Martell High School as he led his team to the 1967 Nebraska Class D State Basketball Championship. Terry was an outstanding player in the smallest high school class. His talents were coveted by Class A coaches as sports writers for the Lincoln Journal Star and the Omaha World Herald wrote, quote, dozens of Class A basketball coaches would have won it all if Ager had been in their lineup. The sports writers went on to write, quote, Ager was something else. He was poetry in motion. 
Later, as a four-year basketball starter for Doan's legendary basketball coach, Bob Erickson, Terry continued his basketball prowess as he scored 1,223 points as he made 39% of his shots and dished out many, many assists. All of Terry's basketball scoring in high school and college was before the three-point shot. The record book would be scorched if Terry had played in the three-point shot era. Terry was also an awesome baseball player as an outfielder and shortstop. He played three years at Doan and had a 350 battering, batting average. He was quick off foot when fielding and running and quick when swinging the bat. Yes, Terry was a gifted athlete, but he was also an awesome guy. He was a team player in athletics and a team player with his coaches and friends. He was a guy who loved to have fun and would laugh at a joke even if sometimes the joke was on him. Not many students who attended Doan during Terry's years had a car on campus, but Terry did. It wasn't unusual to see someone other than Terry driving his black, fastback, two-door Mercury Comet. No doubt that, may, that car made trips to downtown Crete or into Lincoln or cruising on the back roads of Saline County. Sometimes it was Terry driving, sometimes someone had, quote, borrowed Egger's car. <laughs> he was that kind of guy. Terry was an active member of Sigma Phi Theta fraternity. He enjoyed the friendship and camaraderie of not just the guys in the fraternity, but all of the Doan student body. He truly enjoyed his college years. He was a good student, a good athlete, and an awesome friend of Doan. Um, and so, when we heard um, of Terry's induction, uh, myself and the rest of the members um, of the fraternity, um, some of which are here in the back with us tonight, um, we decided that we also wanted to give a gift um, to Terry's family uh, just to commemorate him. So, I'll pull it out here. So, in our fraternity, we like to uh, represent our letters uh, wherever we go on campus. Um, we like to ma make it known um, that we have pride in our fraternity. Um, so we recently purchased um, some baseball jerseys for all the guys in the, in the frat um, and got our last names uh, printed on the back and the numbers that we wanted. Um, so in Terry's memory, we also got one for him and got his last name. So on the front, it says Siggy's established in 1947, which is when our fraternity was founded. Um, and then on the back, it has his name and his number, which was 22. So. Well, I didn't know really what to say up here, and everybody's kind of already said it. So I want to thank everybody for this. I just wish that Sarah could have been here, and Tara and Coach Erickson, that would have been great. And I got a note the other day from one of Tara's former classmates, Bill Pallett. Some of you remember Bill from Crete. And I thought what he wrote was good. It said what I thought needed to be said, but I could never said it. So I'll just read you what he wrote. He said, congratulations on Terry's well-deserved induction into the Doan Hall of Fame. He has, I have so many fond memories of watching Terry play. When we scrimmaged the Huskers, he was the best guard on the court, and he nearly beat 15th ranked New Mexico State by himself, and probably would have if the three-point line would have been in. He says, I knew Terry by reputation for years, Everyone was afraid to get in the batter's box against him in junior high. And we all followed his success in basketball and football when he was in high school. He said, it seems strange that we only lived about 12 miles apart, but he says, I never did meet him until he came to the South Shrine football team. And that's when he changed his mind to come to Doan from Hastings, and Bill had a lot to do with that. He said, I will always remember Terry as one of the fiercest competitors I have ever seen and also one of the really, really good guys. Thankful to have got to know him, Bill Pallett. And that's all I can say. Thanks. Peg, thank you. Very well done. Thank you, members of Sigma Phi Theta. Chad, I'm going to have you come forward. And there is something I want to present to you. I think this is a gift from Larry Andrews. So, Chad, if you would come up. The uh, schedule of the 1997-98 basketball team at Doan, and this is now yours. <laughs> that's, a, that's a cool photo. Congratulations to the Edgar family. It's great to have all of you here tonight. Very well represented, and that doesn't surprise me at all. Thank you. Congratulations.
Coach Dave Dunnigan is one of the best Rose coaches in the country. If you want to find him, the best place to do so is to stop by the shot put ring in Fear Fieldhouse or the outdoor throws area by the softball field. You will find him working with a number of Doan athletes, positively impacting their lives. We think so much of Dunny that we inducted him into our Athletic Hall of Fame in 2015, and that was very well deserved. When I asked April whom she would like to be her presenter, her response was immediate. That's easy, Coach Dunnigan. So Dunny, I'm going to have you come up here and talk about April Cockrow-Smith. Coach Dave Dunnigan. I don't have all that much here. I had to print it really big because I can't find an eye doctor around this town. <laughs> oh, there's one here. I first met April uh, at a track camp in Baird. I don't remember how many days it was. How many days were we going back then, Ed? Five? We were going five days in. <laughs> uh, but I do remember that her parents drove her 100 miles each way to bring her from Rushville. Parents had to wait the entire day. We had a uh, three-hour session in the morning, three-hour session in the afternoon. Parents had to sit around there for seven or eight hours and then drive back home. Um, I don't remember how old April was, but I don't suppose she was more than, I don't know, 10 or 12 years old then. I can tell you that I was... Uh, wasn't usually that all that excited about the young ones. It's hard to hold their attention when you're doing drills for three hours. Boring drills. Uh, April was different. She was attentive, almost always had a smile on her face, which wasn't very easy at Baird because it was usually hot and the uh, area that they put us in was like the desert. It was sand and gravel and rocks out away from everybody else. There wasn't any water. <laughs> Camels didn't even go that far. <laughs> yeah, so we sat out there for three hours, came walking in. These guys are standing around by the, by the hoses. Uh, we're going, where the hell were those for us? Um, April uh, also had a, one other thing going for her. She could make things fly. Didn't take an expert to realize she had a gift. If I could point her in the right direction, she could go far as a thrower. Now, April had a lot of success. She was an Olympic got Junior Olympic National Champion, had a stellar high school career. She wasn't just a good thrower, she was a good volleyball player, a good basketball player, and was recruited by a lot of colleges in sports other than track. But her success in track brought her a lot of Division I offers. I recruited April, and I'm gonna, I, I, I take a little liberty with this part of the story. I recruited her hard. I, I'm not going to tell you that, that there's, a, there's a little caveat in here, but uh, uh, but I was aware that, you know, April, April could go almost anywhere she wanted. She ended up going down to KU. I made a lot of trips out west. And I saw her in high school. I saw her at the bowling alley. I saw her at uh, a lot of different places. I knew Rushville pretty well. She decided to go to, to Kansas. I followed April. I remember telling her that if they weren't nice to her down there, come and see me. About a year and a half passed, and then one day I heard from her. We talked, she decided she wanted to come home. Rest was history. You can read that, all that history in the uh, program. April was the uh, most dominant female thrower in the NAIA for the next two years. 
Uh, throwing wasn't the only passion that drove April. For some odd reason, she wanted to be a coach. Tried to explain the pitfalls of a coaching lifestyle. <laughs> but she wouldn't be dissuaded. After college, she uh, took a job as an assistant coach up at Chadron State. She had some early su success in the coaching arena, but had much more success in the arena of life. She met Bob Smith, her rock and her soulmate. Together they embarked on an amazing odyssey that took them all over the country. Along the way, the family grew by two lucky boys. Where the heck are they? Oh, there they are. Now, April left Chadron, took a job at Appalachian State in Boone, North Carolina. Her success continues, as did her rise as one of the top female coaches in the country. She became active in the USATF and is now an instructor in the USATF coaching certification program. I never got a level one in the USATF, but I did instruct in the TAC long before the USATF came into being. Uh, a few years ago, the family packed up and moved across the country to Fresno, California. April currently coaches at Fresno State. I don't know how she and Bob do it. Coaching, recruiting, getting the boys to all their activities, and traveling around to all the USATF activities. But between the two of them, they've become quite a team. Uh, family's always been important to April. As I said earlier, parents drove 200 miles a day to listen to some goof from Doan. They didn't miss many of her activities, and they made sure she got what she needed in order to be successful in all of her pursuits, all the while running the family ranch. Amazing job. Uh, the sacrifices they made to enable April to become the person she is today shine through in the finished product. April's become a highly respected coach, a surrogate mother to many college athletes, as well as a loving and supportive mother and husband to her two boys and Bob. I'm proud to say that I got to spend a little bit of time in, in the life of such a wonderful and successful woman, wife, and coach. She embodies the characteristics that one would want in their child. She worked hard and she polished her gift. She's also the one that you would want as your child's coach. It's an honor for me to introduce you to Doan Hall of Famer, April Cockrell Smith. Okay. I'm usually pretty good up in this situation, so um, I just want to say thank you. Uh, when I received this, and Ed called, <laughs> make sure I'd be able to not have a track meet on that weekend. <laughs> um, I don't think I even really told anybody for about a week, because um, it just didn't seem real. A lot of how his story was told was very correct. I couldn't be up here if it wasn't for my mom and dad. Um, we didn't have a lot. I think my first pair of Nike shoes came when I went to college. I didn't know I needed them. Um, they made sure I had everything that I needed. And it was more than enough. They ne made sure I never, I never uh, missed a meet, I never missed a game. And if dad couldn't go, he made sure mom could. <laughs> um, and in fact, I think, uh, they even made a trip to Canada when nationals hit. So um, the support I just the support that you instilled with me is the whole reason I'm up here. And thank you, Mom and Dad. Um, the don't coaching staff, um, Dave, and Special Ed. <laughs> <laughs> Those three were staples. And I think I was like 12 when I uh, first met them. And I wanted to be a hip athlete. And Dave said I was dumb. 
<laughs> and after I run the 800, I agreed. Um, what that staff instilled in me as an athlete through high school, it was like they've had a sack of magic. And it didn't matter what he said, I threw well. I um, had a 33-foot PR the first time I met him in the discus. And I, I couldn't explain why. He didn't, he, it was just like a sack of magic. And as the recruiting process went, this is where the story's different. <laughs> I didn't want to go anywhere else but Dome. And I never looked anywhere else. I went on visits just because I'd never really been out of the state when it came to like Arkansas and some of those places. It, I thought it'd be kind of cool to see what it looked like. <laughs> um, but I knew I wanted to go to Dome. And then I got word that Dave was going to retire and wasn't going to be at Dome. So then I had to start looking for a school. And that coach came and then she left two months after and whole rig and roll, I got a coach that her and I didn't see eye to eye. I wasn't used to being told I couldn't do something um, because that's something that not only the Doan family but my family instilled with me. There is nothing you can't have. You just may have to work for it. There's no dream that's too little or too big that you can't have. And when the Kansas coach told me that an inch to qualify for nationals, I had no chance in hell, I knew she wasn't my coach and that she didn't know who I was. We went to Drake Relays and Ed came up to me and he said, April, Dunny's coming back. That Monday I transferred. So Joy, I greatly appreciate you giving him back. <laughs> um, the only reason I came back was because I knew my dream of being on a Wheaties box would be because of him and the staff. So that's the true story on the recruiting process. Um, Ed, I think, gave me my first pair of throwing shoes because I threw an LA gear high top basketball shoes. Because <laughs> that's all I had. <laughs> and they were awesome, but he gave, and I still have them. Um, so this has been my family for a long time. Um, as for my new families, I thank Dave and Glenda Smith for allowing their son to marry me <laughs> and jump to Vegas when I took a job and uh, put me and him together. He is truly my rock. I think he's the only one that could probably handle my crazy, as they say. <laughs> um, and he's the one that when I think things are rough, he reminds me who I am and what I can accomplish. And I thank you for that. And as for my two boys, they're pretty awesome. <laughs> Coach Dunny made sure that I always chose a man that was tall and had high calves because that was better genetics. <laughs> I got them both. <laughs> so, uh, so we kind of joke about what little genetic creatures we might have sitting there. <laughs> um, thank you for putting up with all the weekends that I am gone and all of the events that I have missed in order to go for my goal. It takes a village <laughs> and I think those, those boys have had um, more brothers and sisters than most people. Um, there used to be a rule on our track team that if either one of them was within 50 feet, you had to keep an eye on them. <laughs> 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 uh, 
and uh, I, I think they even told some of my recruits that that was kind of a deal. If you don't like kids, you need to leave. <laughs> so um, I don't think they know anything but sport. Uh, but thank you for your sacrifices of me not being where I need to be sometimes. Um, and as far as the rest of my family and my friends, um, amazing. Lisa, my best friend back there, who I met at Dome, um, always kept reason <laughs> because I was truly fearless, almost to uh, a detriment once in a while. I think Coach Wiley was always nervous if we had a free weekend. <laughs> I just wasn't sure what I'd, I'd be doing, whether it was volleyball or something else. So um, Lisa always kept a little bit of voice of reason. Um, and in fact, when I gave birth to my second son on the Friday before conference, I uh, wasn't going to miss conference championships because you don't do that. <laughs> and uh, my boss flew her out. And she sat with me and my newborn and my oldest so that I could sit on a cell phone in a hospital <laughs> and talk to my athletes. So thank you for being you. And I see a lot of other people in this room when I worked at Student Life and everything else. Thank you for all of your support. And thank you for, and thank you for being the Doan family that you are. Um, this honor is amazing, and I am honored to be with who is being inducted. It's a pretty cool dome thing. <laughs> and I know exactly what she means. <laughs> um, so thank you. And thank you for um, this awesome honor. Last summer, Rick Schmecker, Rick is my good friend back there in the, yellow, in the uh, orange polo videotaping this event takes care of sports information at Doan. Rick stopped by my office, as he often does. Usually he wants to talk about the Royals or the Chiefs, and I dismiss him. <laughs> but I'd rather talk about the Vikings and the Twins. And he doesn't care about those teams. He asked me if I had ever heard of Frank Juarez. Before I responded, he said, take a look at this. Rick showed me Frank's stats and accomp accomplishments at Doan. As the bio in the program indicates, Frank won the conference golf championships during his freshman, sophomore, and junior years, three years in a row. And then World War II disrupted golf during his senior year. Listen to this. When golf was canceled, he then joined the tennis and track teams and subsequently won the javelin at the conference track meet. Frank also played football and basketball at Doan. Rick went on to tell me that while he was researching Doan tennis statistics, he found Frank's Doan golf statistics. It appears that back in the day, and I didn't know this, golf and tennis competed in the same town on the same day many times. There must have been a lot of crossover between those two sports. It took me a while to locate members of the Juarez family. And early on, I was discouraged with my lack of progress. Then one day, I heard from Pam Arnone, the daughter of Frank Juarez. Side note, Pam wanted me to add that the word education should also be included in the bio where Frank's love of country, faith, and family are mentioned. And I promised Pam that I would do that. Moving on, I then became acquainted with Dr. Jihad Shashara, grandson of Frank and a pediatrician in suburban Chicago. And it's such a pleasure to have Jihad with us tonight and his son Malik from Chicago. Jihad, the floor is yours. Welcome to Doan. Good evening. Thank you uh, very much for this uh, tremendous honor. Um, I want to acknowledge um, my dear cousin, Elizabeth Aguilera from Omaha, who came tonight, who I haven't seen in, in several years. It was great catching up with her. Um, and I want to acknowledge uh, Frank's daughter, Susan, my mom, who's watching on Facebook. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, and my aunt and everybody else who's watching. Um, speaking as 
Frank's grandson. This is a very touching thing for me because none of his grandkids ever met him. He passed uh, way too soon um, when our parents were still teenagers. So what we know of him was from my, my grandma kept around the house, the pictures of him, but she was very private. Um, didn't talk about him a lot, but um, you know, his kids did. And I want to show you a little bit about you know, what he was. He grew up in Fairbury, um, that's where he was born, back when it was a busy railroad town, um, in the Depression. And as everybody knows, times were tough back then. There was a time um, where they were living in a railroad car. Um, they weren't the only ones. He was one of a family of six, six we've decided, right? Six, yeah. And um, money was always tight. He wanted to go to college. Um, there's no way that they had the finances to do that. Um, and his father said, why do you want to do that? Just get a job. Um, but he wanted to be able to do more. Um, so he sacrificed hard um, to get what he could. And he was blessed to get a scholarship at this institution. He kept sacrificing. My mom told me the story that when he got here, um, for the first part, part of the first semester, he didn't have housing. And he ended up living in, uh, you know, he spent some time living in an observatory. And damned if I didn't find it today. Um, and this place molded him. He loved to compete. It was very evident in everything that he did. My mom tells me that you know, he kept golfing uh, for years um, uh, with a local church. Um, in the bio, it documents some things I didn't know about the volunteer work that he did. Um, he eventually started sort of working uh, with the newspapers in Chicago. You know, he was a, a typesetter, and he wasn't just that. I mean, back then, people up and down the boardroom, you know, from, from the boardroom all the way down to the, the production line, you know, there's much more communication. He knew all the great titans of Chicago journalism. He knew Irv Kupsinet, he knew Mike Royko, he knew Suds Turkle, and they all knew, they all called him Frank. Um, and that was part of the inspiration that led him to found the first Spanish language newspaper in Chicago. Beyond all that stuff, he was a loving husband and a tremendous father. Who did leave you soon? Um, and he gave a great example for my parents, for my mom. And so I'm always indebted. All of us are indebted. Without this place, you know, there's no me, there's no uh, family in Lombard, Illinois. So we're all very appreciative for what you did and what you do. So with that, um, on behalf of the Juarez family, the Arnone family, the Shashara family. Thank you for this wonderful honor. And may you keep doing it for kids uh, down the road in the future. Thank you. I am so glad I found this family. It took a long time. Rick can tell you there were times that I was ready to chuck it in. I didn't know, I didn't know how to get a hold of these folks. And I'm so grateful that I did. And it's awesome to meet this family. What a great known family. And what a, what a story. What a story. As I mentioned earlier, last July, Matt Franzen became director of athletics at Doan. It is appropriate for him to address you at this time. In addition, Matt will introduce Bob Stitt, who will be the presenter for Brad McClatchy. The common denominator here is the great 1993 football team at Doan. And I would ask that you refer to Brad's biography in the program, talks about that season. It is also appropriate on my part to introduce the head coach of that team, Fran Schwenk, who is here tonight, also a Doan Hall of Fame member. Fran, would you stand? Tom, would you stand? Tom was a defensive coordinator on that team. Tom Hood, also in the Hall of Fame. 
one of the best teams in the history, one of the best teams in the history of Doan. I'm going to have Matt come forward at this time to share and to introduce Bob Stitt. Well, truth be known, uh, well, as Cody said, this is my first year in this position, and uh, we meet uh, with our uh, administ athletic administrative staff once a week. It's so myself, Cody, Haley, Rick, and Greg Sire, our athletic trainer. And um, most of the year, those meetings uh, have gotten better, but especially early on, consist of me asking, okay, now what do we do this next week? Tell me, give me a heads up on what's going on. Well, when the Hall of Fame event came up, uh, I asked Cody, I said, well, Cody, what, what does the athletic director do at the Hall of Fame event? And he, well, nothing, really. <laughs> you, pro you probably need to be there. And uh, okay, uh, and uh, fortunately, I think Cody maybe saw my little glimmer of disappointment in that, and uh, and probably a day, well, it was a short time later, once once the invitations went out, and he knew that Bob Stitt had been invited and accepted to come and present uh, for Brad, he said, he said, Matt, I'm 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 going to have you, I'm going to have you introduce Coach Stitt. So, cool. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to quick give you the rundown of, of, uh, of Bob Stitt's resume, which is which is pretty impressive. Um, he uh, after after graduating here from Doan in 1987, he went on to grad assist at the University of Northern Colorado. Uh, he came back to Doan in the fall of 1990 and spent four years from 1990 to 93 as the offensive coordinator and also the offensive line coach. And those coincidentally happened to be the four years that I spent playing offensive line here at Doan. Uh, went on from here to Austin College in Texas where he coached from 1994 to 1998 as the offensive coordinator. Harvard, the Harvard University, where he's the offensive coordinator for one year in 1999 before moving on to take the head coaching position at Colorado School of Mines in Golden, Colorado. He held that position from 2000 to 2014, 15 years, in which he won three RMAC titles, went to the Division II playoffs those three years, and also produced one Harlan Hill Award winner, which is the Division II Heisman Trophy, also naturally a quarterback. From School of Mines, he went to the University of Montana, where he's the head coach of the Grizzlies for three seasons, 2015 to 2017, taking them to the FCS playoffs once. Uh, went on from there to Oklahoma State University, where he was an offensive analyst last fall in 2018. Um, I'm not exactly sure what an offensive analyst does, but at Oklahoma State, it probably has something to do with managing the mullet of the head coach. I'm not sure. <laughs> And after this last season, uh, Coach Stitt moved into the offensive coordinator position at Texas State University in San Marcos, where he starts his next venture, his next journey. Uh, so a couple things real quickly about Coach Stitt, and, and I want to touch, because I have the mic, on that 1993 team. Uh, we had a hell of a coaching staff, and they've been introduced, and, and, and the three uh, the three cogs, the three key points are all here. Coach Schwank, our head coach, Tom Hood, our defensive coordinator, and of course, Coach Stitt, our offensive coordinator. Uh, when I showed up in 1990, Coach Stitt hadn't been hired yet when I was being recruited. It was Coach Schwank and also Coach Reeves, who's here tonight back as the offensive line coach here at Doan. And when I showed up, here was this young offensive coordinator that was quick, quickly introduced, we were quickly introduced to, I didn't know it at the time, but when I do my math looking back at it, I'm pretty sure that he was 25 years old. He didn't show that, all right? Um, he went out of his way, I, I'm pretty sure, to make sure that, that it didn't show. Um, he knew his stuff, uh, and it didn't take long for the Doan offense to turn in to something really special. For me personally, um, I spent the last 11 years before moving into the, the athletic director position this year as the head football coach here at Doan, and Coach Stitt was one of the most valuable mentors uh, that I had in those 11 years, especially at the beginning. Um, you know, a good mentor, in my experience, will, will really bring you to the good times and help you get there. Uh, more importantly, they'll really help you through the bad times. Um, a few examples, uh, some advice that I got from Coach Stitt 
early on, uh, before I started my first season, he said, Franzi, and he's one of two people that I've known to ever routinely call me Franzi. One is Shannon Smith. <laughs> the other one, I should say, is Shannon Smith. <laughs> said, Franzi, the first year, you will not know which way is up. I thought it can't be that difficult. He was, he was spot on. First year as a head coach, you do not know from day to day what's going on. You're just trying to stay that far ahead of the athletes. I will tell you that the, it pretty well holds true as the athletic director, too. Uh, the other, excuse me, one of the other things he told me, and I think this one was before my second season, we were talking about, about the, uh, some of the players and whatnot and some of the lessons he learned coaching here at Doan. And he said, you know what? Thinking back, one of the biggest mistakes that I ever made at Doan, I should have started Brad McClatchy when he was a freshman. Well, he told me that, and we were in the recruiting process for our second class, and, uh, and we were in full rebuild mode at that point. And at that point, I knew that Anthony Dunn was going to be our starting quarterback the next year, and he hadn't set foot on campus yet. But I thought... He's the guy, we're going to start a freshman and we're going to build for something special. And it happened Anthony's senior year. Um, so Coach Stitt's fingerprints are all over the Doan uh, passing record book, not only in Brad McClatchy, but also in Anthony Dunn, who holds most of the passing records that Brad doesn't have. Um, one of the other things that he told me, probably the most important uh, of these three, is as a football coach, Work to build a roster where you would trust every player on your team to babysit your kids, your children. And when he told me that, I thought, you must be out of your mind. That, <laughs> that was in my first or, se or second year. And I can honestly tell you, I can honestly tell you that we were able to do that. And, and the teams that we had, there were usually one or two kids a year that maybe you, you might not trust them <laughs> to babysit, at least, at least for long. But the, the two playoff teams that we had, um, no question from top to bottom, I would have trusted those, those young men on our roster to babysit my two daughters from noon to midnight. So those were great pointers. Um, I was asked once, fortunately, and, and, uh, to give a eulogy for one of our players who we lost in a, in a horrible accident seven years ago. Um, when you're asked that and you've never done it before, you know, you're looking for some guidance. I called Coach Stitt right away and said, Stitty, I, I don't know what to do. Have you, have you ever done this? And he actually said, unfortunately, he actually said, yeah, Franzi, I've done it twice. Uh, he said, I can't tell you exactly what to do. Uh, he said, write out your remarks so you don't have to stand there and think. Write out your remarks. Um, and then he told me some things not to do. And I'm not going to go there. But... Uh, he said, if you want to get through it and get through it clean, here's what you don't do. And that was priceless information, which I used, and we got through it. And um, so I thank you, Coach Stitt, for those things. So without further ado, let me introduce you to my coach and my friend, Bob Stitt. Thanks, Franzi. I, you know, I think we did put a, a roster together that, that uh, we, we did trust everyone on, on that uh, team to, to babysit uh, our kids. Uh, but then I thought Smitty was on that team. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. I ended up hiring Smitty later at, at Colorado School of Mines. But it, it, it's great to be back. And it's great to be employed. So uh, it's been a long year. So... Um, it, it, it's it, it's really good, and I, I uh, got to uh, I got the holdover from Oklahoma State, uh, the orange tie, so I got to use that. But uh, when, when Brad called me a few weeks ago uh, to to come back and be his presenter, you know, it, I, I realized it had been 25 years since I talked to him, and and you, you've got a guy that. You talk to every single day, and you're working with so closely, and then all of a sudden, you get another job, you get ingrained in, in what you're doing, and, and then you wake up one day, it's 25 years later. And, and he got me on, on the uh, phone, and we talked a bunch, and it was like uh, it was, like it was uh, 1990, 
the spring of 1994 all over again, you know, before I, I took the job in, in Texas. And no social media back then, and no, no cell phones. You know, it was hard to, to keep track of people. And, and it's great now because you, you can look people up. And you feel like, even though you're not talking to them, you feel like you know them and you see their kids. And, and it, was, it was great to see Teresa again. And, and Taylor and Brody got to meet them. And, and really proud of, of what Brad's done after we got, got done with, with football. And, and uh, you know, what would we, uh, you know, how did we ever get by with, without cell phones, you know, back then? And uh, I got my first cell phone at 32 years old. And uh, because my wife was pregnant, and uh, I was too cheap to buy one, but uh, uh, my my son actually asked me, uh, "What t type of cell phone did you have when you were a kid, Dad?" And I'm like, "I didn't get one until I was 32." He's like, "How did you survive?" <laughs> but, but I told my wife Joan, and, and we were dating back uh, when, when I was coaching Brad. And I, t I told my wife Brad had called and asked me if I could come back and, and present him. And uh, she asked if I, I was going to go back, and I said, absolutely. You know, my family and I wouldn't be where we're at right now if it wasn't for Brad McClatchy. You know, he, he, was, he was a start of, of it all. And, uh, uh, you know, when I took this job, I was 25. And uh, I wasn't much older than, than a lot of the kids, a lot of the seniors on the team. But uh, I just, uh, I worked my tail off and, and tried, tried to uh, fake it through the early years and, and uh, get these guys to, to play their tails off. But, uh, uh, you know, they, they say every coach needs a, a good wife, a good dog, and a great quarterback. Not necessarily in that order. Uh, I didn't have a wife or a dog when I was coaching Brad, so he had to make up for, it for the other two. But uh, uh, I, I can't take credit for, for recruiting Brad Fran did that. Fran found the guy that uh, uh, w was going to make us great. And uh, he was a guy at Lincoln Southeast that took him to two state championships. And, and uh, uh, nobody thinks a 5'10 quarterback can, can play. You know, and, and you don't look at the height, you look at the heart. You know, and and uh, Fran did a, a fantastic job of, of finding Brad uh, up in Lincoln. And uh, so thankful that, Fr that Fran allowed me to come back and, and uh, he gave me my first full-time job. And uh, uh, he, he allowed me to run his offense and he, he, uh, he took a chance because they were running the veer, they were running the option, and I was going to come in here and we were going to throw it all over the place. And, and uh, uh, I'm sure there were many, many, many nights he went home and, and told Sue, Stitt is crazy and I don't know why I hired him. And, uh, you know, so uh, when we, I just want to tell you a little bit about how, how this all came out with, with Brad. Because uh, when we got here, I didn't know much about him either. And uh, uh, I hadn't helped recruit him. And, and uh, we had some upperclassmen quarterbacks. You know, we've got this freshman, but uh, we had a JV team at, at the time. And, and uh, freshman didn't play. He went and played JV. And the, the upper cap classmen played and, and uh, you know our plan was to move forward with those th the upper class quarterbacks and uh, we went through our first season we won three games and uh, wasn't as good as the previous year Fran had won five and we went three you know throwing it around and, and uh, again he he hung in there you know with me and and uh, believed in what in what we were doing and uh, Brad got to play JV all that year and didn't, didn't uh, I don't know, did you get a rep in a varsity game your freshman year? My bad. So, uh, <laughs> we didn't have spring football back then. So it was also difficult to see what a guy like him could do because you got no varsity reps. And, and so you have to wait all spring, all summer and go back in, into uh, uh, fall camp and and uh, he uh, he ended up coming out of fall camp as as the backup guy but I, I just had a feeling he was the guy and uh, we still had an upper class quarterback and and uh, uh, we opened that 91 season at Fort Lewis a, a division two team we we're in AI and it, uh, Division two team, it's a, it's a tall task. We played him at Cherry Creek High School, met him halfway and uh, I don't know how many drives we allowed the other quarterback to go. It might have been one, and uh, it wasn't going the way that we thought. And and I told I told Wags, Sean Weigel was on this headset. So I said, "Tell McClatchy to warm up." 
And I can remember Fran going, are you sure? <laughs> I say, yeah, get the class ready. Are you sure? <laughs> so again, Fran thought I was nuts. And uh, uh, we, we put, uh, it put Brad in the game and it all, all of a sudden clicked. I mean, it just happened. He was making plays that uh, nobody else had, had made, you know, up, up to that point, and, and he just made it easy. He just made it easy. He was finding, he was finding things open that we had never seen. We never threw it to, to those people, and I was like, how does he know that? He had a sixth sense, you know, uh, and uh, we used to run a, a lot of the naked bootlegs. Uh, it's like the, the fake 26 naked, and uh, we'd run it, and, and you would turn your back to the defense and you'd roll out and you were supposed to throw it into the flat or a guy crossing the field and we would run a backside post that there's no way you can see it and know that it's open and time and time again he would hit the backside post he would just stop and let it go and it was a tough pass because you're, you're rolling out and it takes so long to get rolled out Usually the receiver would outrun the throw. It'd, make, it'd be tough to uh, make that throw. But thank God Smitty was running those routes and uh, <laughs> gave him plenty, plenty of time. So. <laughs> so, so anyway, he, he just did things. That, it was just so much fun because as a young coach, I wanted to come up with all these things and he could do them. We'd draw up all this stuff and he would do them. And, and uh, uh, it, it, it was just, uh, you know, it, it was, when I first started, I mean, I, it was, it was uh, an unbelievable feeling for me and I can't thank him enough because it, it gave me the confidence to know that, hey, you, you probably can do this for a living. You know, the next couple of years, we were, we were okay. We we're five and four, five, three and one, and, uh, but we were really close, getting better every single year, every single game, we were getting better. We were so close. We did, it didn't show on the scoreboard always, but we were, we were getting better. So we started the 93 season off with eight straight wins, and uh, uh, we were averaging over 44 points a game in those first eight games, and uh, we were lighting it up, and uh, there's a lot of guys in, involved in that on that team that we were so, so close as a team, but Brad was the guy that, that was uh, running the show for us, and heading into that last game we played at Hastings, I think we were number two, they were no, maybe number three, or vice versa, we were top five teams, and, and they were very, very good, and it was a slugfest back and forth. It wasn't a, a game that we scored a ton of points. You know, it, it, it was a really, really tight game. It was 14-10 uh, towards the end of the game, and, and we had the ball, and you know, two things I remember during that game was Jerry Drake. I know Brad remembers Jerry Drake, because he's about... 6'3", 255 pounds that could run like a running back. And they actually played him at running back and he ended up playing in the NFL for the Arizona Cardinals after that. And uh, uh, we had a pass play and uh, we snapped the ball, Brad drops back, Lar T. Myers, our right tackle, d decided to not come out of his stance. And Jerry Drake came off the edge and hit Brad square in the chest and put him into the ground. I'll never forget it. My heart stopped at that time. And Brad jumped up. He ran off the field. And I know he had the wind knocked out of him. I know he was hurt. And he ran all the way to the sideline and sat down so nobody could see that, that he was hurting. And, uh, you know, that, that was one of the things that, that uh, really showed me what he, was, what he was all about. And the other one, that I remember from that game because it was a long time ago was we're down 14 10 and we called a quarterback sneak and you just know that if you call quarterback sneak it's kind of like Tom Brady if you call it he's gonna find a way to get it in and uh, you know we, we run the, the play and uh, he we, we score on the, the, the quarterback sneak to seal you know what we thought was the victory and we're we're celebrating, and I'm and we're going crazy in the press box. Except, except, Brad decided to throw the football into the stands, and we get a flag. So now Hoodie's got to stop him. And they're going to have a short field, a 15-yard penalty, a short field, and it all worked out. We we had to stop him on the very last play of the game, and uh, and, and win that game, and that was an undefeated season for us. But that kind of show he had he had some fire, and, and uh, 
that was one of those, you know, those, those things that that wasn't premeditated. And, uh, uh, but he, he, was, he was so fired up, you know, about scoring that touchdown. That was just what came out of him, you know. And, and uh, uh, Brad finished the, you know, his career, the all-time leading passer at that time and uh, in, in Doan history. And, he, and, it, and that was only three seasons. And, uh, you know, he's still second overall. And his 93 passing total is still a record, 20, 2,863 yards. And, and uh, back then, people didn't throw the ball, you know. So that, it was a ton of yards, you know, back, back uh, in, in the 90s. And, uh, you know, what made this guy what he is? You know, he's an undersized guy, didn't get recruited much, you know, and, and thank God Fran was, was uh, smart enough to go grab him for us. And, uh, you know, I, I asked a lot of his teammates, I called some guys. I wanted to hear from them what they thought of him. And these were the things that, that came out of their mouth. I, I wrote them down as, as I was listening to the conversations, you know, and, and tough, winner, competitive, Kenny Stabler off the field. <laughs> so anybody that, that doesn't know Kenny Stabler, he was really wild off the field and liked to have a good time. So I was like, hmm, I, I wasn't aware of the Kenny Stabler off the field. So Brad, I'll meet you over at the field. We'll have a little up downs and gassers and we'll take care of that. Just kidding. This is what made him what, what he was. And Kenny Stabler was the same type of guy that his, his teammates would do anything for him. Uh, some more. Coach uh, on the field. He kept us in line. You know, the whole line wanted to celebrate in, in the uh, end zone one time. And, we, and they were all talking about, we score this time. We're all doing our dance in the end zone. And Brad's like, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> So he kept those guys in line because we had a lot of personalities on, on that football team. Uh, another thing, he was clutch. He never got rattled. We never questioned if he was going uh, to come through for us. Uh, killer instinct. We would have died blocking for him. Also, the same guy said he was too good of a passer because we threw it too much and we never ran the ball. That's coming from an old lineman. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but anyway. Uh, what I've found over my time, this is going into 33 seasons, is, is uh, you, you need a quarterback that, that the, the offense can take on their personality, okay? And you'll see that. You'll see that in pro football, college football, everywhere, that the, the team will take on that personality, you know? And, and you see it in the NFL and all the, all the greats. And uh, not, on, not only will the offense taken on, the defense will take on the personality of the quarterback. And that's what happened to that 93 football team. The defense wants to play so hard to get off the field to give that guy back the ball. You know, that's what, that's what uh, Brad did for our football team. So um, it's, he was a guy that elevated the play around him. Everybody wanted to play so hard because they didn't want to let him down. You know, and that, that is, is something that, that is priceless for, for a football team. You know, he, he was a, a selfless leader, and he loved the game. You've got to find, you got to recruit football players that love the game. Some guys like get, to get recruited. They like the stats. They like the notoriety. You've got to find guys that love the game of football, and, and that's what, what Brad was, was all about. You know, he didn't care about stats. He didn't care about awards. He just wanted to win, you know, so... So anyway, I'm proud of him, and uh, like I said again, I'm proud of, of what he did for us, you know, as, as coaches and, and teammates, but I'm really proud of, of what he is today also. So with, with that being said, I want to present to you one of the greatest of all time to put the orange and the black on for the, the Doan Tigers, Brad McClatchy. Well, those guys just told three-fourths of my speech, so I don't know what I'm going to do. Brands and especially you. Um, gosh, I don't know where to start. Um, you know, if you're going to pick a team, pick some players, if you're throwing the ball, kicking the ball, come pick me, I guess. But if you're uh, getting a speech and debate team together, don't pick me. <laughs> um, I'm going to start by just, you know, I want to thank the selection committee and 
everybody that was involved in nominating for, uh, nominating me for the honor. Um, I want to congratulate April, Anne Marie, um, the Juarez family, the Egger family for receiving the award. Um, it's pretty uh, pretty good company to be with. Um, you don't really hear of five sport athletes in in college nowadays. It's very impressive. Um, very humbled to receive this, to be part of the 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 Doan Hall of Fame. The last two months has just been a circle of emotions, I guess I'll say. It's really brought back a lot of memories. Um, you know, when you get out of school, you kind of move on. Family, kids, chasing them around, taking them to events. You kind of forget some things. So there was some uh, a lot of a lot of good memories that came back to me the last few weeks um, when I look back at the times here at Doan. Um, the university not only allowed me to have a great education and be part of a really good football team, uh, but it afforded me the opportunity to go to New Zealand. I went to Holland, um, and then I ended my career over in Finland with Sean, uh, all playing football. They're, those are just, I mean, opportunities that I would have never had if it wouldn't have been for the university. So I really want to thank them for, for allowing me to be part of those other teams and those other opportunities. Uh, overall, you know, I really feel that there's three three main contributing factors uh, that got me here today. Um, the first is coaching, second, teammates, and the third would be my family. Uh, first, I'm going to start with the coaching aspect of it, and I want to talk about Coach Schwenk. Uh, as I think it was Stiddy that mentioned, um, you know, Coach Schwenk is Doan's winningest coach over his 21-year career, and he's also a Hall of Fame inductee. Uh, I have some pretty funny memories looking back now of sitting in my, my mom and dad's living room with, with Coach Schwenk there recruiting me. He's got a, for those of you that don't know Coach Schwenk or have never talked to him, he's got a very, very distinctive voice and a very, very, very distinctive vocabulary. <laughs> there's, there's still are quotes that come out probably monthly that are all related back to my time here at Doan. I just remember, you know, kiddo, kiddo, you, you got to come join the Tigers. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I will never forget that. And he was a great recruiter. You know, he made me feel like I was going to be the next, at my era, it would have been like Turner Gill, you know, uh, living in Lincoln, watching the Huskers. He, he did a really good job making me feel like I was going to be the next Turner Gill. Um, I don't know if he knew this. I don't know if very many people knew this, but Doan and Fran, he was the only person that recruited me out of high school. Um, I appreciate you saying I was 5'10", but I'm 5'8". Uh, 100, <laughs> 165 pounds soaking wet. <laughs> Not, I don't think many people are going out and looking for that style of quarterback for their pro-style offense. So I really want to say thanks, Coach Schwenk, because I truly believe if you wouldn't have came to my house, wouldn't have recruited me, I don't know if I would have played football in college. I don't know if I would have went on. I, I don't know where things would have taken me. So I really appreciate it. Um, next, I want to just quickly recognize a, a, a good player, coach, and friend that's not here tonight. It's uh, Coach Sean Weigel. Wags, as everybody knew him. He was, our, he was a senior when I was a freshman, came in. Um, great guy. Uh, we played together one year, and then he turned into a, an assistant offensive co uh, coordinator under Coach Stitt. Uh, you know, immediately when I came in, he he he's just the, he was the jokester. He gave you somebody to look up to. He immediately became your friend. He didn't belittle you as a freshman. Uh, he, he was a really good guy. Um, Sean still holds several records of his own here at Doan. Um, after my senior year and grad graduating, he was, uh, you know, trying to get into coaching, and he ended up taking a job over in Finland. And those teams at that time could have one American on their team if it was the quarterback. Sean invited me to, to go over there and, and play with him. Um, so we went over, played with the Senioki Crocodiles for a summer, had an unbelievable summer, one that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. So I want to thank Sean for everything he did for me. You know, all the coaches – here at Doan were very, very dedicated. 
at least it seemed like it when I was when I was here. Um, I really want to say thanks and give a shout out to the defensive coaches, um, Coach Hood, Hall of Famer, Coach Fye, Hall of Famer, um, Coach Herman, Dunnigan. Um, you know, as the old saying goes, everybody knows defense wins championships. Our defense did a really, really, really good job in those years, especially the 93 season. And I, I spent some time and I looked through the record books before coming here today. And there are, st I mean, every category on those defensive categories, we still have either individual or team records from those 92, 93 seasons on the defensive side of the ball. So you guys did an unbelievable job, great job. Um, last but not least, I, you know, I want to talk about Coach Stitt. I don't know really where to start after he just threw me around a little bit, but that's all right. Um, you know, he was an All-American running back here at Doan. He still holds several, several records himself at Doan. Uh, he was in the top ten for rushing yards in his career. He holds records for kick, uh, kickoffs and punt returns, and he still has the number one spot in the record books for the longest run from scrimmage, which was 99 yards. Pretty impressive. A guy eats, sleeps, breathes football every day, all day long, 24-7. I, I, I truly haven't met anybody that has as much passion for it as he does and as much want, will to succeed. I really don't think that if it, if it wasn't for his dedication and, and want to win that I don't think our offense would have been that as successful as it was. He, he brought it, and he taught us, and he expected us to, to learn it and to do it, and we did it. The one, the one memory that I got to share with you from Coach Stitt, though, is back when, when I was a freshman. Roll into Smith Hall, get through, I don't know, maybe a month or two of the football season, and he pulls, I think it was my freshman year, he pulls me into his, his room there. He was an RA or the, yeah, the resident administrator of Smith Hall. And he pulls me in, and he's like, you got to see this, McClatchy. You got to see this stuff. This stuff's amazing. And I'm like, Okay, what? And he pulls out this big gallon tub of protein powder and weight loss stuff, whatever it is. And so the guy convinces me. Now this, I'm a I'm a third string freshman running or quarterback trying to get a job on the field. So when the offensive coordinator asks you to get involved in his pyramid scheme to sell protein powder <laughs> underneath of him, you go sell the protein powder. So I did that. I did that for, I don't remember the name of the stuff, but it was not very good. <laughs> Maybe it was the protein powder that made me be a good quarterback. I don't know. Um, so one thing I really remember about, I guess it would have been the time between my freshman and sophomore year, that Stitt and Weigel went off and they went to go to some coaching camps to you know, improve and get better. And they went and sometimes, I think it was over on the West Coast, I think they went to a 49ers camp or maybe the Buffalo Bills were involved, but I, I, I vividly remember the 49ers. So comes back and they change our offense. I mean, the, I, I was an option quarterback in high school. I got recruited to run the option in the Veer, come in here and they change it to a pro style offense. You know, four receivers, shotgun. I can't see over my kids, much less the linemen. So I don't know why we decided to do it, but we did it. And, and I will always remember um, sitting there on Sundays watching the NFL and we'd watch the 49ers play and I would tell the, my friends what play they were going to run before they ran the play. And they'd look at me and they'd be like, how, the, how did you know that? And I'm like, that's our play. They took our play. <laughs> but it was, it was, I mean, we'd, the F angle, you'd see it. You'd know that Rathman was going to be running that, right? Yeah, that was pretty, it was pretty fun. Pretty neat to see that. Um, that, that offense, I think, not only rejuvenated us as players, but I really think it reju rejuvenated Coach Stitt. Um, his time and commitment that he put in to the team, but more importantly to me as a player, made the difference for me. Nobody prior to that had ever taken the time to work with me as an individual. It was always more of a team sport, both football, basketball, baseball, whatever it was I was playing. It was a, you didn't get the individual attention. I didn't play on any select teams, anything like that. Everything was geared towards the team. So he took the time and the commitment 
to make me a better player. Uh, both he, uh, he and, and Sean Weigel, they, they would do you know film and workout sessions with us. I remember vividly being over in the field house with the receivers. They'd take that tape and they'd tape it down on the ground and you'd have to do your three-step drop and they'd be timing you and if you didn't hit it right then you'd have to do it again. The receivers had their tape out and they'd have to hit their marks and everybody was in perfect synchronicity. They had to be, everything was timed. If it, if it didn't happen at the right time, start over, do it again. Through that, they made us very, very, very confident. I truly believe when, when we broke the huddle, we'd call a play when we broke the huddle and we would walk up to the line of scrimmage, everyone on that offensive team expected that play to work. We knew we were gonna perform, we knew we were gonna get the first down, we knew we were gonna do what needed to be done on that play. And if it didn't work, nobody got down, walked back to the huddle, called a different play because we knew the next one was gonna work. It was just that type of an offense. It was that type of a situation. I can't thank the coaches enough for, for having the passion and the want to succeed that they did because they, they made the team float. They really did. Um, the second contributing factor is, is my teammates, of course. I mean, this is an individual award, but everybody knows that's it's played in any type of a team environment. You, you know, there's no way to achieve it without a great team. You have to have the supporting roles in the cast around you. Uh, looking back, I, 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 I really believe that you know our team, we didn't have the best athletes when you looked around the field. Um, you know, I kind of jokingly say that we have a, a receiving core kind of like the Patriots. You know, they're kind of like the, the slow white guys that nobody wanted. But they could catch the ball, right? So I really want to you know, thank everybody that was on that team with me. They were all very, very, very dedicated. Um, I remember when we came in, we had a real large freshman class. Um, I want to say that we had probably 20, 22 freshmen on that team. And as seniors, almost everybody was still on that team. We had very few people drop out. My senior year, I don't think we had 22 starters on offense, 11 on offense, 11 defense, but I think it was pretty darn close. I think we probably had I don't know, 18 to 20 starters that were all from that same class that all came up together. Everybody knew what their job was. You never had to worry about the guy next to you. Um, everybody was going was gonna to do what they needed to do. Um, a couple statistics I'm going to share quick. That, that 93 season, my senior year, we had 28 players on that team that got an all-conference honor. That's more than any other team in Doan's history. 28 players on that team received an all-conference honor. In 1993, that team finished second nationally in the United States, the highest ever ranking that Doan's had. And if there was an award that for the least amount of sacks, I guarantee it would go to the offensive line. Uh, I want to congratulate two players that I had the honor of playing with at that time that are still supporting Doan. Uh, Matt Franzen at the AD, former coach, and Chris Bessler, who's now the head coach at Doan. Appreciate you guys sticking with it. Um, third thing is family. As everybody knows, you know, it's hard to get to where you're at without having a good supporting cast. Um, first, I want to just say thanks to a lot of my good friends that are here. Obviously, I consider them family. Um, Brian Bach, Tim Trainer, Mark McKenzie, um, kids I grew up with all the way back to third grade, competing with them and everything. Heck, Brian and I would compete race into the car if we could. So um, some of my more adult friends, I guess, that I've uh, become good friends with that are here tonight, um, Larry Welch and his family, his wife Allison, uh, Don and Christine Thompson, um, Anton Yost, who I played with, at Doan, uh, and then have stayed in you know good touch with him, and have become good friends with him throughout the the years. All really good friends of mine. Thanks, you guys. I appreciate you here being here to support me. Um, I really appreciate the you know just again the support and the competitive spirit that you guys have. Don't let that die. Keep it going. Um, to my wife Teresa and the kids, um, Taylor and Brody. Um, I'm really thankful that you guys could all be here today to celebrate it with me. Thank you. 
Um, each of you guys inspire me, in, you know, each day in your own way, and I really, really look forward to living the next chapter of my sports life through your guys' eyes and all your games. You know, in closing, um, it, it's really, it's like, it's, as the other inductees had said, it's very humbling to receive this award. Um, it wasn't something I planned out or thought out, you know, 25 years ago. It's definitely, definitely, definitely the pinnacle of my athletic career. And in kind of a weird way, it, it almost brings closure to sports in my life. I mean, other than golf, what do you got? Uh, you know, however, the, the, with that, it does come, there's a, a pretty big void sitting on my shoulders. And it's, it's because I don't have my parents here to celebrate this with me. You know, the other inductees had mentioned that, how it's, you know, they, your parents take you everywhere, they're unselfish, they do everything. You know, as a kid, you don't, you don't think about that, you don't realize that, you probably don't even care about that when you're 16, 17 years old. It takes until you're out of the nest, 25, 30 years old, and you can look back and really appreciate what they did for you as you start your career, your next generation, your life as a parent, and have your own kids. As a parent now, you know, I can look back and I can see what they went through with my sisters and I. There's three of us and all the activities and driving that they had to do, every place they had to take us. Um, no complaints. They're very unselfish. And, uh, you know, my dad told me over and over and over in his life that their goal was to make sure that all three of us had a college education, which they, they accomplished. I really thank them for everything that they did for my sisters and me. So lastly, I'll leave you, I'll leave you with this. Um, through Doan, the university, and through football, it's provided me with really, really good memories that I'll, I'll never forget, never forget. To Taylor and Brody, you know, I really hope that you guys get a chance to experience something in your life similar to what I experienced at Doan. It was, a, it was a, an unbelievable opportunity. And relating back to, you know, to what Coach Stitt did for me, just, I guess I'll say, don't be afraid to let somebody in your life that, that wants to make you a better person or an athlete. I truly hope that, a, you know, a mentor, a coach, a teacher, somebody can step into your life and have an impact that's going to make a difference to you, just like Coach Stitt the university, and the other coaching staff did for me. Thank you. As we conclude this portion of our special night, I would ask you to give a group round of applause for all of our inductees. I told a lot of people that this would be a very special night. I, I knew that immediately when we select, selected this class. And it's absolutely true. This is a special class of people and their families, and that's just awesome. So glad that all of you are here tonight. In summary, I am blessed to have played a part in this celebration, and I really enjoyed working with our special guests and their families and my Doan colleagues in putting this event together. It was certainly a group effort. Good evening, God bless, and go Tigers! Yeah.